Here's a fun task. The next time you take out the remote control and watch any mainstream media news on TV, no matter what your political affiliation or interests are, count the number of pharmaceutical commercials you see. In any given hour of broadcast, how many did you come up with? Remember that number, because they're the monetary sponsors of that news show you're watching. In the comments section, feel free to tell us how many pharmaceutical commercials you saw in an hour. An article from May 15th, 2019 states that the pharmaceutical TV ad outlay outranks most other industries. And that was five years ago. According to a Forbes article in 2022, if we just take into account the top 10 pharma companies, they spent $3.9 billion in 2021. It's obviously significantly more now. Don't we all feel like there are more pharmaceutical commercials now than ever before? For any marketing and sales buffs out there, why are these ads considered by drug companies good product exposure? Who or what exactly is the target market? Known as a passionate artist. Known for loving the outdoors. Known for getting everyone together. No one wants to be known for cancer, but a treatment can be. Keytruda is known to treat cancer. I have type 2 diabetes, but I manage it well. It's a little pill with a big story to tell. I take once daily Jardians at each day's start. At least Jardians get you to sing their jingle. On the plus side, these commercials describe what the drug is for. But how about these that are not quite as clear? Nothing comes close to this place in the morning. I'm so glad I can still come here. You see, I was diagnosed with obstructive HCM, and there were some days I was so short of breath. I thought I'd have to settle for never stepping foot on this trail again. I became great at making excuses, but I have people who count on me, so I talked to my cardiologist. I said there must be more we can do for my symptoms. He told me about a medication called Camzios. Okay, and then when you dig in, what's obstructive HCM? Doesn't a physician have to diagnose this first? Or is this a which came first, the chicken or an egg scenario? Nope. First you need the diagnosis from a healthcare professional, and by that time, some type of remediation would be the next step. Oh, and back to our previous video about unspecified ICD-10 codes, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, unspecified, as the diagnosis, or J44.9 for COPD. Shortness of breath could be from a lot of different things, and not something that a patient would walk into a doctor's office and say, I want Camzios because I have shortness of breath. Let's look at another. When your child has moderate to severe eczema, it's okay for them to show off. Show off their clearer skin and noticeably less itch with Dupixent. Aren't you convinced with an eight-year-old showing off his clear skin? So which one is better? Dupixent, Skyrizi, Rinvoke? Watch those commercials from Skyrizi and Rinvoke to really get confused. The point is that there are so many examples and so many of these commercials are really medically esoteric. It's up to the medical provider to make the best choice with you as the patient. Here's a question with one might assume an obvious answer. Is the target audience someone who has the disease and is looking for treatment? significantly smaller than the overall viewer audience? At best, it might be people suffering from the advertised condition. It's not like this is a food commercial or a car commercial out to target everyone. But even people suffering from a disease is an unfocused target audience, knowing how decision-making and healthcare encounters work. Clearly a disconnect. We can theorize as to how the drug companies look at it. They are providing consumers with information about new medicines and treatments for diseases that were previously untreatable. But this makes no sense. But the consumer viewer of TV ads are not healthcare professionals, not to mention the fact that most of these commercials rarely provide a clear consumer use message that everyone can understand. How many times have you asked, what is that stuff for? Another pharmaceutical claim is that TV ads encourage patients to open a dialogue with their doctors about their medical conditions and illnesses. Communication that might not have previously existed. That is mighty altruistic of these pharmaceutical companies. We keep pressing this point. How many of you really understand what these commercials are saying? I dare say we don't, and frankly we shouldn't. Not without some interpretive subject matter expert intervention. 
With that notion, another weird thing we see from this advertising has to do with why pharma commercials are riddled with side effect disclaimers that would scare the public out of even mentioning these medications to their healthcare providers. Well, we know the answer to that. One big fat word, liability. And that cancels out any clean target market for these commercials. So what's going on here? Is this a way for pharma to buy influence in the media? After all, they are sponsors for these programs and without money, no broadcast. You decide. What is the propaganda objective of these commercials? You would hope that these commercials should be aimed at healthcare providers, educating them on new viable treatments and medications available. Yet pharmaceutical companies continue to spend money on the mass audience of these commercial slots, remembering that most of us have no idea what these medications are really for and what they're treating. So what's the motivation? Name recognition? To who? The insurers? Is there an ulterior motive? Thankfully, we do see some reasonable commenting out there in the healthcare domain. The American Medical Association and public health advocates have called for restrictions on direct-to-consumer drug advertising, warning that it inflates demand for newer, more expensive drugs at the expense of less costly alternatives. But they are just calling out pieces of what's wrong, not the whole thing. It's not about a demand for newer treatments, but more like trying to empower patients as persuaders in the pharmaceutical marketplace, and that's wrong. We should know our limitations. Consumers are not subject matter healthcare experts, and these commercials require education and context relating to consumer patient care delivery. We are sure that if you speak with healthcare professionals, they say they may be spending needless, unnecessary extra time explaining pharma drugs and commercials, which may or may not be suitable for a given patient treatment. Then there's this argument, that pharma is trying to reduce self-treatment and encouraging deference to professional medical judgment. Again, hard to imagine that when the real focus of these commercials should be the ones able to prescribe. We're not all doctors, so how are you empowering the patient? This is not checks and balances on the physician healthcare providers. This gets down into diagnosing a patient. First, in basic terms, there needs to be a diagnosis from the physician through testing and then protocol treatments discussed with the patient. This is the encounter, why you go to the doctor, to get treated. Protocols are usually developed primarily from the physician community with no pharmaceutical bias. Not like in the Harrison Ford movie, The Fugitive. Profasic. As I will show you tonight, Provasic is remarkably effective and has no side effects whatsoever but from a real-world, peer-reviewed, and tested process and feedback with data. That's checks and balances. So lots of questions asked in this video, and for now let's do some more theorizing. What if we took that pharma advertising expenditure and allocated it in some other way? Washington lobbyists, class action lawsuits against healthcare monopolies, rebates back to the insured, other ideas that you, our viewers, can think of, Call it what you want, but sometimes simple, practical approaches can really apply to very bloated systems such as healthcare. Sometimes just taking a pen and paper can do the trick to cutting costs and breaking up monopolies like in the movie Dave. Uh, okay, before we get started, uh, a couple things I'd like to go over in the budget. Okay, let me just add that uh, to the uh, tally here. That'd be plus 47, nine. Five, carry the one, makes six hundred and fifty-six million dollars, which means we can keep the program. We went out of our way in this video not to answer some of these questions, but we hope that the next time you see a pharma commercial on TV, it'll make you stop and think, or maybe just ask yourself, how am I persuaded, or better yet, how does this affect me? Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to see more of our content.